looks good. Perfect. All right. Good evening, folks. It's it's good to be with you. Although it's uh, virtual, I, I can't. I can probably speak for all of us when say I'm I'm zoomed out. Um, but but I want to you know kind of segue the the program into talking about weed management and corn. And I promise you, this won't be my last corny '90s movie reference. So get ready. Um, you know, most of y'all probably won't appreciate it. <clears throat> now, where I wanted to begin um, here today is, you know, we talk a lot about start clean, stay clean. And, you know, we focus a lot on this component, the stay clean with post-emergence weed control residuals throughout the season to keep the weeds from coming up. But for y'all, you, you've got a unique situation in that southern Piedmont that complicates burn down. And so that's where I wanted to start off today, particularly with one of the most troublesome weeds that y'all have with Italian ryegrass. <clears throat> so Italian ryegrass, uh, you know, long standing been a problem in the southern Piedmont and small grains production, um, but it also complicates uh, burn down for y'all as well, planting into soybeans and corn. Um, traditionally, the ACCase, ALS, and glyphosate worked well on Italian ryegrass, but, you know, with with the use of those products in small grain production and then glyphosate burn down, we now have biotypes um, in, in your neck of the woods in particular that have multiple resistance to these modes of action. So, you know, what do we do for a resistant ryegrass. So here's a, a, this is from some work that Dr. York did years and years ago. Y'all know y'all started with whole line resistance. Then you had ALS resistance with Osprey and Powerflex in, in small grain production. Um, you know, and, and this is a picture from some work that I did um, where we were trying to burn down some ryegrass before planting cotton. And this is 32 ounces of Roundup uh, after the grower had sprayed Roundup two times prior, and this is what we got. Now, this is nothing new to y'all. This is at Eastern North Carolina, and some, you know I'm getting more and more complaints from that part of the world from something that y'all been dealing with with several now. So really, we're kind of at the bottom of the barrel in, as far as what do we do burn down for controlling glyphosate-resistant Italian ryegrass. So, so really, what do we do? Um, well, here's uh, more pictures from that trial. Uh, here's the non-treated compared to Roundup. They look exactly the same. Um, you know, some folks, are, you know, have asked about the ALS inhibitors. So, you know, in particular, lead off, it's got a component called remsulfuron, which is typically really good on the cereal grains. However, this biotype is likely, majority of it's likely ALS resistant because the lead off didn't help that much. Um, but this is what most folks want to ask about. They call and ask about Roundup plus Select Max or Roundup plus a generic clethodium. Um, and for y'all, for folks, especially in your neck of the woods, um, I, you know, am wary of, of you know, recommending that because y'all have had use of ACCA's herbicides in wheat production, like Holon and Axial, and there's a good chance that the biotype you're dealing with has some ACCase resistance. So that clethodium or cethoxidem may not work. Um, so it may just be a waste of money, but that's not always the case. There are some situations where those products still work. So um, if, if you're worried about it, you might want to try some before putting it across the whole farm. Now, you know, really, if we got Roundup, ALS, ACCase resistant ryegrass, paraquats all you have left if the ryegrass is emerged. That's the only thing left for post-emergence ryegrass control. Now, the thing about paraquat, we know it's, you know, works much better when the weeds are smaller. Uh, and then if you wait too late in the spring because you've been kept out of the field from weather, prime example right now, we should probably be doing a lot of burn downs right now. However, it's been wet and folks ain't been able to get in the field. So I anticipate not many folks have, have started their burn downs. But, you know, uh, if you wait, if you get too late, it'll likely take two applications of paraquat to get uh, a good clean seed bed ready to plant your, your corn or soybeans or cotton or what, whatever. Now, there are some things that we can do to improve uh, control, post-emergence weed control with paraquat, especially on ryegrass and other troublesome species. Um, one, one thing that I recommend is the addition of a, a group, uh, excuse me, a PS2 inhibitor like Diuron on Cottonland 
atrazine on corn land or metribuzin on soybean land. And this is something that'll improve the activity of that paraquat. And basically what these this chemistry does is it slows down paraquat. And when you slow down paraquat, you actually get a better kill. That's why we get better control with paraquat sprayed early in the morning, late in the evening when there's not a lot of light intensity because we actually allow that paraquat to move a little better and we end up getting a better kill than in the middle of the day. So what are we going to do about Italian ryegrass that's multiple resistant to ACCA, ALS, and glyphosate? Well, if it's submerged, again, I've just told you paraquat is the last thing to control with merged ryegrass. Um, I would suggest putting a photosystem 2 inhibitor with it, especially if that ryegrass is on the large side, you know, atrazine, metribuzin, or diron. I also comment too, you don't have to put a lot, you know, you don't have to go out with the full rates burn down. Um, at the, you know, it may be something you want to do for residual activity, but if you're just trying to heat up the paraquat, you don't have to go whole hog and, and put your, your full residual rate out in your burn down um, thinking that it'll, that'll improve the paraquat. It just takes a little bit to improve that paraquat activity. Now, what are our other options? Well, before emergence, you know, we could have a fall burn down with some residual products like dual, you know, dual, zidua. Um, those are probably the two that you're most likely looking at. Um, that would be only if you can get it before the ryegrass comes up. However, we've got a lot of topography in y'all's neck of the woods and, and we just can't have bare ground all winter. So be aware of that it, it would be important to have some kind of residue to hold the world together if you're planning on doing something residual wise in the fall to keep that ryegrass from coming up. Now, <clears throat> the other thing that I wanna draw your attention to and, and I can't say for sure right now, but y'all have got some interesting stuff going on with paraquat and ryegrass in, in your part of the world. Um, Wes and I got called to some fields last year where paraquat performance in the fall was not where it should have been. And, and the fall is a time where we think we get, you know, should have gotten pretty good control of small ryegrass. Uh, actually the weather when these uh, this paraquat was sprayed was actually really good for applications in the fall. Um, and we got unsatisfactory control with paraquat. Um, now, I'm not saying it's resistant, but we're definitely paying close attention to it. And I can tell you that we've collected plants from these fields and we've brought them back to Riley and we're going to grow them out, the seed out from these plants and, and try to confirm if we actually have paraquat resistant ryegrass or not. And so this is actually the title of a proposed proposal that Wes and I put forward that got funded looking at paraquat resistant ryegrass and if it exists in North Carolina and, you know, should we be concerned? And I can tell you, we should be concerned. Um, it would not be unheard of to have paraquat resistant ryegrass in California, in orchard grapes and alfalfa, where they use a lot of paraquat, they have paraquat resistant ryegrass. And what should really be scary is in California, they've got a biotype resistant to the ACC herbicides, Roundup, and also glyphosate. Now, if you think about the resistant biotypes we already have in the Southern Piedmont, they're already, a lot of them are already ACCA, ALS, and glyphosate resistant. If you couple that with paraquat, you know, we're really left with, I, I don't really, I, to be honest with you, I don't know what we'll do post-emergence to control emerged ryegrass. Um, and so that's, this is what we're trying to figure out and get out ahead of. But I will say, if you're having trouble with paraquat, and I'm not talking about you know, in April when the, par the ryegrass got knee high and you sprayed paraquat and it didn't work. I'm talking if you're catching, trying to catch the ryegrass early and you're not killing it with paraquat, um, that's definitely something that we need to be checking out. So don't hesitate to, to get up with us. Now I'm going to just spend, a, you can't talk about corn without talking about the usual suspects. And most of the time that's Palmer pigweed. Um, thankfully for in corn weed management, one of the foundations of, of all of our programs should be atrazine, and thankfully atrazine still works on palmer pigweed here in the state. Uh, so that's something that has to continue to be uh, incorporated wherever we can put it. It's not, a, it's not a herbicide that we're putting a lot of pressure on, a lot of that mode of action doesn't get used a lot like some of our other herbicides, modes of action. But 
in, in most situations where we have just a, a normal population of Palmer pigweed, uh, a group 15 like dual, warrant, outlook, zidua plus atrazine is, is probably what you need to be looking at pre-emergence. If you've got a, a big population or a, 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 some new land you picked up that's out of control, that's where I would tell you to do uh, a group 15 plus uh, HPPD inhibitor um, plus atrazine. So something like Acuron or some of these other products that have a bleacher plus group 15 and put a little more atrazine with it. Post-emergence, uh, you'll see a lot of these tank mixes, regardless of what trait we're using, have atrazine suggested um, residual control with the group 15s. If we have emerged pigweed, the group 27s plus atrazine are going to work well. Dicamba, safe in dicamba in the form of status and diflex would work well. Uh, Liberty corn, Liberty works well if the pigweed's small. And then in conventional corn, we still have some options um, for, for pigweed control if you're growing conventional con corn. Uh, you know, dicamba, atrazine, the group 27s plus atrazines would, would be good tank mixes for managing pigweed in those particular systems. Now, here's a picture from some of my plot work, and I'm just trying to show you we don't have to get fancy to control pigweed and other weeds. This is atrazine plus a group 15 pre. Uh, we got it activated, and then we followed that up with a timely roundup plus uh, group 27, so like a Callisto or a Laudis, an Impact, an Armazon, plus a group 15. So we don't have to get really fancy. We can get good control, especially if we get activating rain on our pre and we're timely with our post application. Now I'm gonna move into the unusual suspects. The first one I wanna start off with is, is Texas Panicum. Uh, it's now called Texas Millet, but I often call it Texas Panicum. It's a summer annual grass. It's got wide leaves that are covered with short, soft hairs. So this is what it looks like when it's emerging, first emerging, it, it's got that broad leaf. It's really uh, indicative of what it looks like when it comes up. Um, you know, some folks, you know, often confuse it with other, other grasses, but those are particularly grasses we don't have here in the state. But why is Texas Panicum so troublesome in corn? Well, it's a large seeded grass, like our broad leaves. If we have larger seeded weeds, they can come up from deeper depths and that complicates management with residual herbicides. It also comes up extended germination and it emerges late. And then the big reason we're having problems with it is we don't get good control with the products like Dual, Outlook, Zidual Warrant, uh, Harness products. They are not good on Texas Panicum. So really our, our, our big residual products that we use for pigweed don't work good on Texas Panicum. They control the other annual grasses, but not Texas Panicum. Now, this is also what's going on in the state. Because the group 15s don't work, we're seeing a weed population shift. This is a field from some of my graduate research. In 2012, this is the same field, the same spot eight years later. In 2012, we had a good mix of crabgrass, goosegrass, a little bit of panicum, a little bit of fall panicum. Uh, after we abused the group 15s two to three times a year, uh, you fast forward to 2020 in this same general area of the field is mostly left with nothing but Texas Panicum. And that's what we're seeing across the state. And this is why we use the group 15s multiple times in corn, cotton, soybeans, and peanuts. So we really don't get away or break that cycle of group 15 use here in the state. And not only should we wor be worried about this from a weed population shift, but we should also be concerned about it from a resistance standpoint because they have group 15 s metolachlor resistant palmer pigweed in Arkansas. Um, and this is kind of a good visual that shows you what's going on. This is actually from a water, two water hemp population, populations in Illinois, but this is closely related to palmer pigweed. And the same general thing is going on with pigweed, but they have these two resistant populations across the top of the screen and then the two susceptibles. And then they use a whole bunch of different rates of s or dual. And you'll see they went up all the way up to 8x rate and they got control of those resistant biotypes with the 8x rate. But when you start getting down here uh, in the normal use rate range, they're not getting control. And what they're actually seeing with these biotypes that are resistant, it's not like we see with glyphosate resistance or um, other weeds where one day the, the herbicide just stops working. With these, 
residuals, it looks like an uh, increase in tolerance that's occurred over time. And they're seeing that these herbicides are not lasting as long as they should. Um, and so if you're seeing or noticing that the group 15s are not working as long as you thought they should or thought they did prior, then that may be something that, that's kind of playing out on your farm as well. So be aware of that um, with the pigweed species and, and potential group 15 resistance. Now back to Texas panicum. Texas panicum is not hard to control post-emergence. Glyphosate works well. If you're in a conventional system, the nicosulfuron products work well if it's on the small side. Um, so it's not hard to control post-emergence. The problem is, is it, it keeps coming up and can come up late. Um, you know, so again, uh, with our group 15s performing poor against Texas panicum, what are our other residual options in corn? And this is kind of what me got uh, interested in Prowl, H2O use in corn for residual management of Texas panicum after talking to one of my colleagues in Georgia, Dr. Eric Prosco. Now, I want to pause here for a second and make sure I'm very clear about this. I am not a fan of Prowl applied pre in North Carolina, especially on our sandy soils. Now, it, you know, it may uh, be okay on some of the heavier land at y'all's way or the Piedmont soils, but I'm not a fan of it. It's just uh, too much of a risk for injury for my, my taste. Now, however, most folks don't know that you can apply it post-emergence. It can go from emergence up to V8 or 30 inch corn. And here's the use rate range. And a lot of times I use it at a court, um, you know, two pints per acre or a court. And when I've applied it post-emergence, here's some a trial that we did last year with Roundup and Atrazine. And this is a healthy rate of Atrazine. And we put a quart of Prowl H2O and we saw no injury. Um, you know, we didn't think Prowl heated up any of the tank mixes that we are applying to corn. So I, I feel like it's very safe. And this is also what my colleague in Georgia tells me, they've not seen any injury problems um, with Prow H2O. And I do wanna point out that I'm using the Prow H2O. Now the Prow EC formulations, uh, they are also labeled post in corn. However, there's two reasons why I, I like the Prow H2O. The number one reason is it's encapsulated. So this mode of action, they're subjected to photodegradation. So that encapsulated formulation will wait on a rainfall for activation much longer than the EC. And then also we know with any EC formulation, you can get increased injury when you start putting other herbicides, fungicides, insecticides with it, adjuvants, et cetera. So that's why I like the, the encapsulated H2O versus the EC formulations. Now, really what y'all are concerned about is what does it bring to the table from a weed control standpoint? Well, it's not great on pigweed, but when we're looking just at Texas panicum, and this is late in the season, 49 days after post, we see with each of our tank mixes, so the blue bars are the tank mix by itself, the orange bars are that tank mix plus prowl. So we had Roundup Laudus atrazine, Roundup atrazine, Liberty atrazine, Halex GT plus atrazine, and Roundup plus Impact Z. And you'll notice across the board with all of these treatments, the addition of Prowl improved late season Texas panicum control. And when you actually averaged it over those treatments, Prowl improved late season Texas panicum control 20%. Um, and then I'm going to show you some yield data that, that also backs this up. Now, I like pictures, so I like visuals. So I wanted you to see these plots for yourselves. This is the non-treated control, and we got a healthy population of Texas panicum, also some pigweed in here too. Uh, now, these the, here's the treatments. The top are the treatments without prowl, and then right below it is that respective tank mix plus prowl, and you can see how much difference the addition of prowl made to the late season Texas panicum control in these particular treatments. Now, I will say of the treatments that did not include prowl, this Roundup, Laudus, and Atrazine, was the best from the treatments that didn't have Prowl. But again, even with the even with that tank mix, Prowl helped a lot late season uh, manage that Texas Panicum. This was very surprising. Um, a lot of times when we do weed work, even when we have uh, these large populations, really bad populations of weeds that we deal with, we don't often see a, a yield response. And this was really cool to see. Um, we had where we had Prow H2O and that improved Texas panicum control, we had an 11 bushel advantage 
compared to the plots that didn't have prow. So that that's a good sign that this is, you know, this will more than pay for that prow addition for Texas Panicum and also tells us how much yield we may be leaving on the table where we don't get good late season Texas Panicum control. And we talk about Palmer being very competitive, but these grass species, especially something like Texas Panicum, they can really rob some yield from corn if they're allowed to stay out there and moisture is limited and they're taking away valuable moisture uh, for that from that corn crop. Now I wanted to wrap up talking about another weed that I get quite a few uh, complaints about, but is not really what I consider a usual suspect in corn, probably a usual suspect in soybeans, and that's sickle pod. And so why do we get, why are we concerned about sickle pod? Uh, similar to morning glories, we have limited residual options. It also has extended germination and late germination. And one thing I noticed with sickle pod in my plots is when I, when I control the emerged sickle pod, the next week I come out there and there's another flush coming. It just seems to come um, a flush every week. And it just kind of, if you've got a bad population, it just kind of, you're kind of inundated with, with sickle pod. But I also think I'm getting more calls about it because there's been a lot more interest in growing conventional soybeans. And, you know, sickle pod is a big concern or very difficult to control in conventional soybeans. So I think just inherently because we're rotating with some of that conventional soybean land, that may be why I'm getting more and more calls about sickle pod. Now, as far as sickle pod control, um, really the, the toolbox is, is to the bare minimum like we have with morning glories. Uh, one that you really need to, to, this is why another reason you would want to use is, you know, as much atrazine as you can for your soil. Um, so atrazine is one that that has uh, got good residual control of sickle pod, one of the few products. Um, this is in a trial where I had a, a good population of sickle pod. This is looking at sickle pod control 38 days after that pre-emergence application. Um, this is looking at sure start. So sure start is clopyrrolid plus flumetzalam plus acetochlor. The acetochlor doesn't bring much from the sickle pod. Um, I'm not really sure what the clopyrrolid does on a sickle pod. But the flumetzalam, which you may recognize as python, is one that supposedly has some residual activity against sickle pod. It's an ALS herbicide. Um, so we got, you know, near 80% control 38 days after pre. With the keystone, that's got atrazine and acetochlor. Um, we were, you know, only about 60% control. But I would expect this to be up here around 90 if we had been using more atrazine. So this was only... Uh, you know, 0.875 pounds of atrazine. If we'd been at a pound and a half of atrazine, we would have been up here around 90%. Um, so that's why it still needs to, you know, kind of be the focus for, for controlling something like sickle pot or morning glories. This sure start, you know, I, you know, it may be something you want to try if you have some bad sickle pod, but I'll tell you if you get some cool wet conditions on some sandy land, you might see some crop response from it. Um, so, so just try it out if you got some sickle pod and see if you like it. Uh, don't go across the, the whole farm, um, you know, with this particular product. Now, again, you know, just kind of give you the take home message on sickle pod. Like morning glories, we need to stretch residual control by atrazine. Um, we need to be maximizing our atrazine season limit. Um, and I would tell you because sickle pod comes up all season, like we do for morning glories, I want you to put a little less atrazine pre, and then I want you to load up on your atrazine in your post application. So put a quart and a half post, so a pound and a half, uh, and that'll get you to two and a half for the entire season. And then don't forget a late post, again, to get those sickle pod that's come up late. Roundup plus status or Diflex would be a good option in Roundup Ready Corn. Liberty works well on small sickle pod. Uh, the Enlist products plus Roundup, if you got growing Enlist corn, would be a good option. Uh, and then if you're in, uh, you know, if you're in uh, conventional corn, you could do Evic post-directed, which is a cousin to atrazine and would work well like it does for Morning Glories against the sickle pot. And that's kind of, uh, that's kind of all I had. Um, I thought I, you know, I, I thought I was talking for 45 minutes, so I had to take some slides out of here. But hopefully I've left a, a few minutes for questions. If anybody has anything uh, they want to ask, now would be the time to do it. Any questions?
All right, going once, going twice. That's it for me.